I was asked in my fairly critical video about Linux desktops to talk about this project that I honestly didn't know about, Omarkey. I swear I enthusiastically visited the project page with no intention of making another critical video. Well, I'm sorry. I don't want to alienate part of my audience with too much criticism, and I swear that in my next production cycle I'll focus more on documentaries, history, and general discussions about free software. I agree too that criticism is necessary, but a constant stream of criticism can sometimes be tiring and worse, cause the message to go unnoticed. The fact is, I visited the site, downloaded and installed Omarkey, and now you're faced with my conclusions. He's the culprit, so blame him. Omarkey is an arch derivative that offers a ready-made Hyperland configuration. Hyperland, for those who don't know, is the window manager of the moment a breath of fresh air in the Linux desktop landscape that has brought a new vision of computer interaction, tiling windows, key bindings. In short, it allows you to create the perfect desktop for geeks and programmers, those people for whom interaction with the graphical interface happens exclusively through keyboard commands. This captures the desires of a good portion of Linux users and materializes them into an elegant, concrete, highly customizable desktop. But it's a world apart. Hyperland isn't a plug-and-play window manager. It's a whole series of scripts and plugins that lead through text file configurations to menu bars, search, customization. In short, it's a highly complex ecosystem that requires significant user experience. This is where Omarkey comes in. It claims to offer a pre-packaged solution for everything, avoiding the process of building your own environment that's typical of those who use Hyperland. This distribution, according to its creator, is made for developers, advanced users who want a suite ready for productivity. It offers a series of, let me use the term, bloated pre-installed software, a whole range of tools. Lazy Git is a delightful alternative to something like GitHub Desktop and runs in the terminal. Lazy Docker is made in the same spirit as Lazy Git and provides a TUI for managing containers and images. BTOP is a beautiful resource manager that shows memory, CPU, disk, and network usage, as well as listing all active processes. Impala is a TUI for managing Wi-Fi connections, and it continues with programs like OBS, Obsidian for Notes, Pinta, all tools you'd hardly find pre-installed in other Linux distributions. It also includes proprietary software, one password, Spotify, Zoom. I don't use the term bloated casually, but I'd say we're getting close. These are very specific and varied programs, and I don't think this configuration is built to please a user base, but rather it's the creator's preferred setup included in the distribution. The included development tools are excellent. Git Cli, Docker, and so on. There's the possibility of using web apps in the Omark menu, and we're talking about extremely popular applications, WhatsApp, YouTube, and so on. The real problem with opinionated distributions like this is that they serve mainly three purposes. Showcasing, showing what can be done with Hyperland, marketing for the creator to build a personal brand, and lowering the barrier to entry. But this is debatable with Hyperland. The crucial question is, whoever needs a pre-configured distribution for Hyperland probably doesn't have the experience to maintain and customize it when something breaks or when they want to change it. A competent Arch Hyperland user would simply prefer to do Pac-Man's S Hyperland and create their own minimalist custom configuration. Even the installation has its limits, representing a compromise between accessibility and that do-it-yourself philosophy that characterizes both Arch Linux and Hyperland. It's not created to dual boot, so it needs an exclusive disk, and this is a major limitation. So who is this distribution aimed at, if not its creator himself? Let's also talk about the aesthetic aspect, because it's undeniable that Omarkey makes a remarkable first impression. The ricing, the aesthetic customization of the desktop, is brought to a professional level. Fluid animations, elegant transitions, a coherent color palette, curated icons. It's visually captivating, and that's exactly the point. Omarkey sells a dream, look how your desktop could be, but it's a pre-packaged dream where every aesthetic choice reflects the maintainer's personal taste, not necessarily yours. And here we arrive at a fundamental paradox. Hyperland was born as a tool of absolute freedom, where every pixel, every key binding, every behavior can be shaped according to your needs. 
Using a distribution that gives you everything ready-made means giving up precisely that freedom in exchange for convenience. It's like buying a custom guitar made by someone else instead of building it yourself. Sure, it sounds good, but it's not yours. The Hyperland community is built around sharing dot files, configurations, custom scripts. It's an ecosystem where learning happens through experimentation, breaking, fixing. Skipping this formative process means finding yourself with a very powerful tool but without the instruction manual written in your muscle memory. When something breaks, and, and with Hyperland something always breaks eventually, it's in the nature of such dynamic and rapidly evolving software. The Omarki user is left stranded. Take updates as an example. Arch Linux is a rolling release, which means continuous updates. Hyperland itself is updated frequently, often with breaking changes in configurations. Those who built their own setup know exactly where to put their hands when an update breaks something. The Omarki user instead finds themselves with a system that suddenly doesn't work anymore and must navigate configurations written by someone else with logic they never fully understood. Then there's the question of bloat, which I mentioned before, but deserves further exploration. Software like Spotify, Zoom, 1Password are extremely personal choices. Many Arch users deliberately chose this distribution precisely to have a minimal system where they install only what they really need. Finding yourself with gigabytes of pre-installed software, some of which proprietary, goes against the very philosophy of Arch Linux. It's almost ironic. You use Arch to have total control, but then you accept a distribution that has already decided for you what you need. The web apps integrated into the menu are another example of this philosophical dissonance. WhatsApp, YouTube, and other popular applications accessible directly from the menu. It's convenient, sure, but a hardcore Hyperland user would probably use lighter solutions, perhaps custom scripts that open these apps in specific browsers or isolated containers. The pre-configured integration removes that granularity of control that is the beating heart of the Hyperland experience. The dual boot limitation I mentioned is particularly problematic. Requiring a disk dedicated exclusively to Omarki means you can't easily test it or use it as a secondary system. This is a major obstacle for anyone who simply wants to try it. You have to commit completely, sacrificing an entire disk. For a distribution that wants to lower the barrier to entry, this is a significant contradiction. Creating dependent users. But perhaps the deepest criticism is this. Omarki risks creating a generation of Hyperland users who don't actually understand Hyperland. They use preset key bindings without knowing how to modify them. They have a beautiful status bar without understanding how Waybar works or which alternative they'd prefer. They become dependent on a configuration they can't truly modify without risking breaking everything. It's a bit like driving a Formula One car without knowing how the engine works. As long as everything's fine, it's fantastic but at the first problem, you're stuck. That said, I don't want to be completely negative. There's value in lowering the barrier to entry, even if imperfectly. Perhaps Omarki can serve as an educational starting point. You install it, use it for a few weeks, start to understand how the ecosystem works, and then, ideally, reinstall Vanilla Arch and rebuild everything from scratch, this time knowing what you're doing. It would be a formative path where Omarki functions as an interactive tutorial rather than a final solution. The problem is that many users probably will never make this leap. They'll settle for the default configuration, use it as long as it works, and when it breaks, they'll jump to another more stable and traditional distribution. They won't have truly learned Hyperland, and they'll probably think Hyperland is too complicated, when in reality, they never really tried to understand it. In conclusion, Omarki is an interesting experiment that raises important questions about the nature of Linux distributions and the balance between accessibility and philosophy. It's an impressive showcase of what can be done with Hyperland, a living portfolio for its creator, and potentially an educational starting point. But as a distribution for long-term daily use, it's difficult to identify the ideal target audience. It's too complex for beginners who simply want a nice Linux desktop, 
and too opinionated and pre-configured for advanced users who would truly appreciate Hyperland. Perhaps the real lesson is that some tools, like Hyperland, are intrinsically meant to be built, not bought. The configuration is the product. The process is the value. Trying to package all this into a ready-to-use distribution is like trying to sell a journey instead of the experience of traveling. You can show the photos, but you lose the very essence of what makes the journey meaningful. But I conclude with a more general vision of this phenomenon, because Omarkey is symptomatic of a deeper problem in the Linux desktop ecosystem. The absurd thing is that we find ourselves in an ecosystem, forgive the term, autistic, unable to grasp the real needs of the broader public, but which always tends to focus on increasingly smaller and more extreme niches. Think about it, we have GNOME and KDE, two mature desktop environments used by millions of people, which still present inconsistencies, long-standing bugs, unresolved accessibility issues, lack of coherence in user experience. These are the projects that would need maniacal attention, that obsessive care for details, that polish and refinement work that we instead see poured into extreme niche projects. I would expect work like this, this attention, this care, this effort in packaging and user experience on a large scale precisely on GNOME or KDE, making them more coherent, more forward-thinking, more accessible, more stable. Imagine if all the energy that goes into distributions like Omarkey, Extreme Rising, hyper-personalized configurations were channeled into improving the desktop experience for 95% of Linux users instead of 0.5%. And here lies the ultimate paradox, where absolute conceptual customization reigns. Hyperland, i3, tiling window managers, vanilla Arch Linux, their prepackaged solutions are created that ultimately serve nothing, or rather, serve only as showcase and self-marketing. Instead, where that same energy would be needed in mainstream desktop environments that could actually bring Linux to the general public, fragmentation reigns, lack of unified vision, eternal compromises. It's as if the Linux community is trapped in a self-destructive loop. The most talented and passionate developers focus on tools that, by definition, are destined to remain niche, while the projects that could really make a difference for mainstream adoption are left in a perpetual state of almost optimal but not quite. Do we want the year of Linux desktop? It will never arrive through pre-configured Hyperland distributions. It will arrive, if it ever arrives, when GNOME works perfectly on every hardware, when KDE has a user experience as coherent as Mac OS, when installing a distribution is so smooth that your grandmother could do it. But this would require resources, attention, and that same obsession with details that we see in niche projects. Instead, we continue to see this phenomenon, incredible energy spent creating yet another arch configuration with yet another window manager configured in a particular way, while fundamental problems, unstable graphics drivers, audio that comes and goes, fragmentation between Wayland and X11, applications that don't follow the same UI guidelines, remain unsolved. Omarkey, therefore, is not just a questionable distribution. It's the symbol of an ecosystem that has lost its sense of priorities, that prefers individual self-expression to collective improvement, that celebrates complexity instead of embracing simplicity. It's an ecosystem where the most visible contribution is not making Linux usable for everyone, but showing how much you can customize your setup to impress other nerds on r slash Unix porn. And perhaps in the end, this is the real answer to the question, who is Omarkey for? It doesn't serve users, it doesn't serve the open source movement, it doesn't serve Linux adoption. It serves an ecosystem that takes pleasure in its own complexity, that mistakes the barrier to entry for a badge of honor, that prefers to talk to its own echo chamber rather than the outside world. As long as we continue like this, Linux desktop will remain what it has always been, an incredibly powerful and flexible system for those who have time skills and willingness to fight with it and an incomprehensible curiosity for everyone else. And distributions like Omarkey will continue to be created, celebrated for a week, and then forgotten while the real problems remain exactly where they've always been.